joining us today on Lattes with Leaders. I'm Zaina. And I'm Trisha. And we're excited for you to join us as we catch up over coffee with CEOs and executives from diverse backgrounds and industries. We seek to discover what is unique about each leader and educate you guys on new and interesting topics. Our conversations seek to enlighten and inspire people from around the world to realize that ordinary people can achieve extraordinary things. You almost need to curate your own profile or your own face for the situations that you're going to encounter. In this episode, I speak with tech leader and actor Zoe Cunningham. Zoe has led an incredible career as a technologist, from starting as a software engineer at Softwire to driving over four times revenue growth in the business as the managing director for over seven years. Zoe has also launched a successful acting career, featuring in Breaking Infinity, The Look of Love, and Nightlands. Zoe shares some great perspective on what it takes to build a multifaceted career identity as a business leader and an actor. Stay tuned. All right. Um, Thanks so much for joining us, Zoe. Um, I'm so excited um, to have you on Lattes with Leaders. To start off with, would love to get a bit of a background on your story. You've had a very wide ranging career. One of the things uh, that I suppose I find quite interesting about my life is I've done lots of different things and they all combine together. So I think that you could look at my CV and say, well, that bit's not relevant. Why were you doing that? Actually, I think for me now, it all combines together. So what I'm going to try and do is I'll try and be um, comprehensive, but brief. (laughs) So that's okay. (laughs) So I started as a, um, a computer programmer in, so I did a mathematics degree and started as a computer programmer uh, with a startup tech firm. And uh, called Softwire. So I've been really lucky that I've actually worked for Softwire my whole career. So I've been at Softwire now for uh, 23 years, which uh, it's quite crazy. It's a very long time. I had the opportunity to work through lots of different roles within the organization. So I worked as a project manager. I worked in recruitment for a while, recruiting um, graduate developers. Uh, I worked as a consultant. And then finally, I moved to the business development team, which was terrifying uh, and consequently the biggest learning experience of my career. Joining the business development team really hammered home that, yes, perhaps we all have things we're more naturally inclined to or comfortable with, but we can actually learn a lot more than we think we can. And actually, just because we don't like something doesn't mean we can't learn how to do it. And the more you learn, the more you come to like it, right? It's like that advice for making conversation with someone, which is to become really interested in in what they're interested in. So if you collect old coins, say, that's interesting. If If you're interested in it and you find out about it and you find out what the details are, um... 2012, uh, I became managing director of Softwire. And I think that was quite important to me because it was a goal that I'd set out for myself based on my previous career successes. Um, I thought, what could I aim at? (laughs) I I actually just sat down um, and I just learned the phrase, we overestimate what we can achieve in the short term and we underestimate what we can achieve in the long term and I thought great five-year goal like the sky's the limit what can I aim for and I came up with this goal of of becoming managing director uh, which seemed super crazy to me at the time I really felt like I was going beyond what was possible so I think that when I did achieve it I've tried really hard to hold on to that memory and to not take it for granted that you know, of course I can run a 200 person company, 
you know, I know I can because I've done it. But actually try and remember that feeling of, is this even possible? Would anyone else believe in me to give me the job? Would I make a total mess of it? Um, Because I think that encourages me in everything else I do, that we can always achieve more than we think we can. This is one thing that I found very unique about your career, is that you have done such a variety of roles, you've experienced a bit of everything, and yet you've still retained this sense of ambition in knowing that you wanted to then lead the company. I wanted to go into that a little bit. Firstly, what it means to define success, because success probably meant different things at different point in, points in your career. Yeah. Um, how do you think about defining success? And then And then secondly, once you've defined that success, you you know, you went through this goal setting process of then wanting to be a managing director. What was your goal setting framework such that you created a plan around that goal and executed on that goal? I think that there's two types of ambition. So I think we all, in general, I don't think there's anyone who can't have a small ambition about their current life. I mean, it probably their their current job or their current role, but definitely their current life more widely of my life would be more enjoyable for me if I were to change this part of it or more satisfying for me. And I think that that is Um, a perfectly adequate level of ambition that we don't recognize often enough because incremental improvement leads to massive results. And actually believing that you can constantly change small things about your life really helps to reinforce that. This is what happened to me. I made small changes and that reinforced my belief that I could make changes and be successful. And that led me to dare to have more ambitious goals. So I think that's um, that's great. And, and I think everyone has small ambitions and it's about working out how you can do them. Secondly, there's big ambitions, which maybe I would call dreams. And uh, we all have dreams. And actually, I'm feeling quite emotional as I say this, because I think we all have dreams. And if you ask a child, a child will not just have one dream, usually. A child will have like 10 dreams. And a child will quite happily go, yeah, maybe I'll be an astronaut, or maybe I'll be prime minister, or maybe I'll be a dancer. And all of those things seem perfectly achievable and desirable. And what happens as we get older is we gradually make our dreams more and more sensible. So we say, I want to be an actor, but that's very hard and very competitive. So maybe I could be a a a corporate trainer because that's quite like an actor and uses a lot of the same skill sets. Um, And obviously, it's, it's great to be able to earn a living, but it's surprisingly unsatisfying to be living a life that's not quite your dream. I think. I believe that and I found it. And possibly your dream encompassed being a corporate trainer and actually you love it and it's the most fulfilling job you can imagine, which of course that's absolutely fine because as you say, we define success ourselves. However, I think almost all of us are living or are even working towards ambitions that aren't really our true ambition. And I think it takes a lot of faith to be able to say, do you know what? It seems ridiculous, but this is what I really want. Um, And it takes a lot of self-belief to go, but I'm going to try. And having been through my whole journey and aiming for my dreams and achieving some of them and still being on the way, I suppose, to achieving others, um, I think it's actually the following, pursuing your dreams is more enjoyable than achieving them. So I think it's always worth doing, even if you don't make it. I really love this concept of dreams rather than goals. It makes it seem like you're tying 
the ambition with the passion um, because, you know, that aspect perhaps has been missing in the conversation when we talk about careers. We talk a lot about what is it that, um, you're good at and how do you define success on around those things and what's your next role, etc. But the way that you've described it, it's almost really in, being introspective and thinking about what are you really passionate about and where do you want to grow based on those passions? And I want to step back a little bit because as you say, like when we were young, it feels like the education system encourages you to dabble in lots of different pursuits and figure things out. And then as you grow older, you're taught almost the opposite. Like you go to <laughs> high school and then you have to start specializing and then, then you have to start specializing even further. Um, and then you pick one career path and then you have to really just focus on that and make that, you know, your career. Whereas you've, you've gone the opposite almost like you've at software, you tried so many different roles before becoming managing director. And then beyond that, as you say, like you've gone into acting as well and, you know, made a successful career around that. So I want to go into this concept of passions because I know like as a kid, it, it was a very straightforward thing to think about, but now as an adult, um, it can be a little bit more complicated. Um, how does one uncover their passion? I was going to compare my dream of being an actor versus my ambition, I would say, of being managing director. That managing director was not a dream for me in the same way. It was a career ambition of can I achieve this? Wouldn't that be neat? And again, I think that was great for me to, to be able to have got to a position where I could have that ambition because aspects of it actually reflect what I like about acting and the journey taught me all kinds of useful things and achieving me achieving it taught me to have belief in myself so i wouldn't say that's a dream in the same way but until i was 35 years old my dream of being an actor was totally buried you could have asked me what would you like to do you can have any job in the world what would you like to do and i wouldn't have said actor because I didn't believe it was achievable. And I think that's how deep we bury some of our dreams. If you'd asked me when I was five, well, if you'd asked me when I was five, I would have wanted to be a ballerina, which perhaps is not quite as achievable as being an actor, but the same kind of performance vibe. So uh, I actually uncovered my passion, which I can, I can tell you, but it may or may not work for you, is I read a book called The Artist's Way, which is a book for unblocking creative people. I was trying lots of different things as well, which I think is super important. I think if you know there's more to be had out of life than what you're doing right now, you do need to try lots of different things and find out what else is out there. So I was doing that already. However, I started this book not knowing what I wanted to do. And I finished it with a deep conviction and understanding that if I were to name my true dream, it was to be a film actor. And it was super clear to me. So yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's helpful or not. <laughs> well, I mean, you don't necessarily have a like there there's no formula to defining your passion I guess like so so I kind of understand that um and it is a bit of a process to be able to just dis to discover the passion in the first place um but you know you did you discovered your passion but at that point you know so you said you kind of discovered it you know after you know 35 years and and at that point most people would just think oh you know wouldn't it be nice but then leave it at that and wouldn't take the next step of actually pursuing that passion. How did you go about doing the pursuing part? Like what made you believe that you could actually go ahead and become a professional actor? Um, because yes, I think there's, there's two challenges to following your passion. And the first one, as we just discussed, is knowing what it is. But the second one is knowing what to do about it and having the confidence to to do something about it for me so I think there's two things that contributed to me 
being in a position to be able to pursue it. And the first was that I had had a career to date when I was 35. So I was already managing director by this point. And my career had consisted of doing lots of new small things and trying small things and getting better at things that I'd previously not been very good at. And I think that was quite foundational because that gave me some kind of innate sense somewhere that maybe even if I couldn't achieve it, I could get a little bit better and that maybe it was go worth going and, and having a little try and seeing if I could get a little bit better. Um, I think that actually was was instrumental. And the other thing was was the book itself. So the artist's way is a little mystical, which we're not very often in the business world. But there's lots of phraseology like, this is what you're meant to be doing. And if the universe didn't intend for you to follow this dream, then the universe wouldn't have given it to you. And so somehow, I can't exactly pinpoint it, but the process of reading this book not only uncovered this desire that was so strong, it's kept me going throughout the ups and downs. And I can promise you there's a lot of downs of learning to act age 35. But it also, yeah, gave me the motivation to start and to just keep doing things, even when I didn't really know what I was doing or where I was going. That is the key part. You know, Some the motivation needs to be there. Otherwise, you can just have that thought and just leave it at that. Once you did have that motivation, you had defined your career at that point by being in tech and moving across that and thinking about your career in multiple facets requires you to not rethink your identity, but think more holistically of yourself um, as a professional. How did you balance all these different aspects of your career so that you could achieve your full potential across all these different aspects of your career? Mm, great question. Great question. And I love the word, like I, I loved your phrase about thinking of yourself holistically. Uh, I think that's super important. And I think that we can all and would all benefit from thinking of ourselves holistically, whether you have a second career or not, everyone has other things that they do and other interests and passions and whether it's even just making yourself dinner or uh, gardening or whatever it is we are so much more multifaceted than we believe and I think all of that is relevant to who you are and I like to encourage people when someone says what do you do you don't have to just say the answer that's your day job. It's not a lie if someone says, what do you do? And you're an accountant and you love gardening to say, I'm a gardener. Uh, in fact, in many ways, it's a much better answer. Um, so I think that we all have the choice about how we think of ourselves. or we, we all can start to learn to appreciate all the parts of ourselves and think of ourselves holistically the challenge comes when you interact with the rest of the world because the world really is set up um, to put people into boxes. And definitely, if you're going for a job with another organization, they will be, they will have an idea of the box that they have and the kind of box-shaped person that's going to fit into that box. And um, only very exceptional uh, leaders and managers, I think, can see beyond that. There are some out there <laughs> and they're worth looking for. Um, but most people, they have quite a narrow idea of what they need and they want to know whether you meet that or not. And whether you're fantastic at gardening doesn't make a jot of difference to them. And actually, if you talk about gardening too much, they'll doubt you're really interested in doing the accounts, which is what they want. So I think there's that aspect of it. So I think you need to create, you almost need to curate your own profile or your own face for the situations that you're going to encounter. So I think, yeah, if you want to work for other people, you'll need a face. If you want to freelance 
or set up your own business, you'll need to curate a face for that. So uh, there are lots of people now living more and more blended lives where you can have a full-time job and freelance, um, maybe doing something you're passionate. So I know someone who works full-time and then they have a cake-making business on the side. Um, But say you're an accountant and you have a cake-making business, you don't want to necessarily write all over that about how great you are with numbers. You want to say, here are my beautiful cakes and here is my passion for baking. And then I think the, the thing that I found hardest was social media, which sounds like such a small thing to have to worry about. But essentially, you kind of have one opportunity to have a headline and a definition of who you are. Because the majority of my income still comes from technology. In fact, almost all of my income comes from technology. I took the decision that on LinkedIn, which is the most professional platform, I am a director at Software First. It's there that I'm also an actor. But first and foremost, I'm a director of Software. I have technical experience. I I talk to that. I enjoyed it actually at the start to on other platforms such as Twitter um, focus on being an actor and say, well, probably not that many tech professionals are going to look me up on Twitter. So actually here I can be an actor first and I'm still going to share technical stuff and I'm still going to talk about it, but that's my different profile. And again, I think there's no right answer here and you'll get contradictory advice from all kinds of people And you have to find out what works for you and what you're using it for and what the options are. As we wrap up, I'd love to um, finish off with any other advice that you want to give to to other professional women out there who are still defining their careers and still trying to figure out what makes them tick and how they should pursue it. What are some final pieces of advice that you'd want to give them? believe in yourself, which can be easier said than done. Um, But I think remember, like, value your own opinion, spend time working out what is important to you, and what you value and what and what you believe about the world. And stick with that. And sometimes you might have to, obviously, I'm saying I'm not saying don't learn and change and grow. But on that journey, Uh, remember that no one's perfect and you're no less perfect than anyone else and your opinion is just as valid. And I think that having a strong sense of self is more important than we realise. It's so We're social creatures as human beings and it's very easy to get caught up in other people's ambitions, other people's expectations, uh, other people's beliefs about how things should and shouldn't be done. And the more you're able to, I suppose you would say, be true to yourself, right? The more likely you are to get what you want out of the world, not what someone else wants you to um, to get out of the world. So for me, that's something I would say to, to definitely think about and try and focus on. And I'd also say that there is so much benefit in trying to carve out and cultivate and fight for downtime. And and as I kind of mentioned briefly, this is something that's become more apparent to me as I've been in a luckier position to have more downtime, rather than being, you know, full pelt going, aiming to be managing director or full pelt trying to have two careers at the same time. You know, as I get older and have more space, I realize how much of our efforts are wasted, if I'm honest, or or don't contribute as much as we think they do to what we value in life. And that if we can let those go, the space we create enables us to make better decisions and get more out of life, not less. We seem to think that to get more out of life, we have to do more, 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 more. And that's not feasible and not sustainable. Again, start small, carve out 10 minutes for sitting quietly or meditation or reflecting on your goals or whatever it is and try and build up to an hour for exercise or a walk or and building up to you can have a day off from your job 
to spend on yourself. And I think to most of us, that seems outrageously luxurious. And I think that we can benefit. I was taught to challenge that by the the book, The Artist's Way. And it's been very helpful for me. That's amazing feedback. And it really sounds like all of us need to read The Artist's Way, (laughs) um, irrespective of what career we want. Um, So I love that feedback. Thank you so much. And thank you for coming on the podcast, Zoe. Really um, love talking to you about your career and your passions and how how you cultivated them. Um, And I think it's going to be a really impactful episode for all of our listeners. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. Don't forget to check out our more recent episodes where we connect with global female CEOs to explore how to make it to the top. Whether your ambition is to be an executive at a corporate, build a franchise or pivot your traditional career, check us out. Be sure to give us a like or follow on LinkedIn, TikTok or Instagram at Lattes with Leaders. Our mission is to hear the voices of women from around the world. So if you're an avid listener and want your voice heard through our platform, please reach out.